A pathless wilderness, wild, rugged. That was the Black Hills of South Dakota in the early 1870s. A hardy frontier, far from the paths of civilization, where fortune beckoned with a glittering smile and life hung on the quickness of a trigger finger. There was gold in them thar hills, gold at Spring Creek, gold at Crook City, gold at Central City, gold on the mountains, in the rivers, and in the dark depths far below the surface of the earth. For centuries uncounted, men have sought, fought, and died for gold, as they did in the Black Hills when the West was young. Brave men came from the North, the East, the South, the West, by the tens, the hundreds, the thousands. They tunneled the mountainside, they combed the gulches, they strained the rivers, creeks, and streams in their wild quest for gold. But the romantic day of the placer miner was short-lived. No more could gold be washed from the coarse gravel of the creek beds. The placers were worked out. The bewhiskered pioneer with pick, shovel, and gold pan had served his day. And that day he served well, for he set the stage for a greater era and new industry destined to take its place with agriculture in South Dakota. Among the men who sought for gold in those daring days was Moses Manuel. He was interested in the scientific mining of hard rock formation, getting gold out of quartz ore so hard it could not be chipped by a miner's pick. Manuel and his party prospected the winter of 1875 without success. And then, on April 9, 1876, they discovered a ledge an outcropping of ore that then was termed a lead. They sank their discovery shaft in the side of a draw, and they called it Homestake Lead, and the mining camp which leaped to life took the name of Lead City. The original site of the Homestake mine has disappeared, and in its place has risen a thriving industry geared to modern progress. Today, Lead is still a mining camp, but a mining camp with 20th century trimmings. The Homestake mine is still there, for lead is Homestake, and Homestake is lead. But mining in the glamorous days of yore is a far cry from the complicated and scientific methods in use today. It takes more than a pick and shovel to get gold ore out of the ground now, and more than a gold pan to get the gold out of the ore. Would you like to mine for gold? Today, gold mining means raw materials, men and construction, combined with the science of chemistry and the wonders of modern engineering, all of which are necessary to make homestake or pay. New construction, which will take two years at a cost of about $3 million to complete. This complex steel structure, the head frame, rises from a man-made mountaintop plateau to reach nearly 150 feet skyward. In this massive building, made with more than 800,000 bricks, steel and concrete, giant equipment will control the hoisting and lowering of cages which carry men and materials. This model of the Yates shaft shows what has to be done, the great construction work underground, blasted out of solid rock, but it isn't done from the top down. The shafts are cut from the bottom up, Tunnels, or drifts, as the miners call them, are blasted from the solid rock to connect old workings with the exact location of the new shaft. Then the latter moves upward in many separate segments, or links, which one by one are merged into a single vertical opening. Precision engineering makes sure the drifts meet the new shaft at the right places. But it's not as easy as that. Opening up a level and placing it in proper condition for mining requires many months of work, drilling, blasting, ditching, hauling waste rock. More than three and one-half million feet of timber, or enough to build more than 200 five-room houses, go into the shaft. This drift leads to one of the ore bodies. Two years to finish the job. Hundreds of men at work under the ground, on the surface, high in the air. Two years of work through the toughest kind of rock. Millions of feet of timber. Hundreds of tons of concrete and steel. 
thousands upon hundreds of thousands of dollars for equipment before one single ton of ore can be taken out. That's what gold mining is today. Where is that old time pick and shovel now? The new Yates plant, when complete, will look like this several million dollar Ross plant built in 1934 with a shaft where operations are now being conducted on many levels. The levels are spaced 100 feet apart down to 1,100 feet. then 150 feet apart to the bottom of the mine. Now we're after gold. Down we go. 8-1. 8 That's the signal we heard a moment ago. The marvels of shortwave radio used for safety in the mining of gold ore. These great and powerful drums each holding more than a mile of stout steel hoisting cable in one layer, wind and unwind rapidly as the cages speed up and down the shaft, carrying their cargo to a safe haven. Vertical transportation, lowering human cargo over 4,000 feet into the earth, four times as deep as the height of the Empire State Building. Flashes of light are levels. An indicating arm is geared with micrometer fineness and tells the operator exactly where the cage is at all times. 3,650 feet, 3,800 feet, 3,950 feet, 4,100 feet below the surface at a speed more than three times as fast as a modern elevator in perfect safety. Over 2,000 men work for Homestake the miners work in two shifts, which are rotated, changes in hours for every man. At home stake, safety is a first consideration. Helmets of light material tougher than steel, work lamps with a battery to keep them lighted for eight hours, steel-toed shoes with spiked soles for safety. But above all, it is the thorough understanding of their job and an unfailing observance of safety practices on the part of the men themselves that have brought the home stake record to its remarkably low accident rate. Prospecting, shaft sinking, drifting, raising, cross cutting, diamond drilling, all preliminary to actual mining of the ore. Here's the air driven diamond drill outlining the gold bearing rock. Gold ore is mined by two methods. The shrinkage stope method, without timber, and the square set method, with timber. These miners are climbing into a stope from which the ore is being removed by the shrinkage method. Shrinkage stope mining consists of breaking ore away from solid rock. As the roof of the opening or stope becomes higher, the miners use the broken ore as a platform on which to work. Loose rock hanging overhead is pried off with long steel bars. Miners call this barring down. Pneumatic drills bite deep into the tough, hard ore to make holes for blasting. 10 feet into solid rock, every day 3,000 steel drills go into the mine. Every day 3,000 steel bits are taken out for sharpening. Prying down loose rock, Drilling holes deep into the ore and loading the holes for blasting require an eight-hour working cycle. Three million sticks of dynamite every year, one million blasting caps to set off a million blasts for nearly a million and a half tons of ore mined annually in the Homestake mine. The blasting is done at the end of the day. Out go the tools and out go the men to a safe place far from the blast. They light the fuses, the smoke curls up. It's all over until another shift repeats the cycle. When the shrinkage stope is mined up to a height of 125 feet, the chamber is filled with broken ore, which must be drawn through chutes into one-ton cars. Strong timber planking and steel guards protect the loaders from flying ore. One ton of ore to a car. 20 cars to a train, 20 tons of solid ore and not a flake of gold in sight. 
Locomotives powered by electricity, locomotives powered by compressed air, all run on tracks from all points underground, run regularly on a complete railway system. 80 miles of steel track to carry equipment, materials, and gold ore. Ore mined by the square set method consists of timbering to take out the ore which was left in place to support the roof and side walls during shrinkage stope mining. These men are working under the pillar you saw in the picture a moment ago. The process is the same here as in the shrinkage stope method. Drill, blast, and remove the ore. Water runs through a rifle drilled hole in the center of the drill steel. The water does three jobs, cools, lubricates, and prevents dust. Down goes the ore to the loading level below, and what punishment that timber takes. It has to be strong to stand that pounding. One foot square, tough timber from the Black Hills. This model shows you what the mine actually looks like a massive underground structure of sturdy timber. The higher up the miners drill and blast away, the farther down the ore falls. The miners go up and the ore comes down. In this subterranean cavern are supplies ready for use. Timber for extending the square set structure, tools, drills and extra equipment standing by on the job for the time it is needed. Air for power and air for help. Every minute of every day, 500,000 cubic feet of fresh air go into the mine and 500,000 cubic feet come out. Clean, fresh air every minute of the day for every man underground. These men are working in a heading, a dead end away from the main drifts and cross cuts of the mine. But they get plenty of clean air through canvas or galvanized iron ventilating pipes. 4,000 feet underground, but still there is air for the miners and air for power. But why air for power? To drive 500 air drills, 38 air locomotives, small ventilating fans, and other equipment. Where does it all come from? Why, it comes from here. These great compressors running day and night furnish high pressure air for many machines. Water for spraying to keep down the dust. Water from sand used in filling worked out shrinkage stopes. Water from the earth, water for the drills. 600 gallons of water pumped from the mine each minute or enough for a city of 20,000 people. And it all has to go someplace. But where's the gold? Let's look for it. That's funny, there's none to be seen. It's there all right but in minute quantities, four-tenths of an ounce to a ton of rock. The ore is hoisted at night. This skip is filled with eight tons of ore, and there it goes. 25,000 pounds of ore and steel at 2,500 feet per minute. All of the new timber used in the mine is lowered through shafts. The old and broken timber is hoisted to the surface. More than a thousand miners are lowered and hoisted through the shafts every day. This heated tunnel leads directly from the shaft to a modern change house. The miners pass from the shaft to this room without going outside. Here, modern facilities guard against sudden changes in temperature, safety precautions on the surface as well as underground. Here's the gold ore again. And what a beating is in store for that rock. The ore is on its way now to the gyratory crusher, the first of a series of crushing machines. No one machine can do the job, so the Simons crusher now breaks the rocks down to about two inch size, like this. It takes power and plenty of it. Two inch pebbles from chunks of solid rock, but it's only the beginning. From the crusher to the stamp mill, 180 stamps, each with a falling weight of 1,550 pounds. 300,000 tons of water are used every 24 hours in the process to reduce the ore to a fineness sufficient for the removal of the gold. The fall is from a height of seven inches 
to break the ore fine enough to pass through a screen with three quarter inch openings. These machines are called rod mills, revolving cylinders 12 feet long, six feet in diameter. Round and round, 10 of them breaking the ore to pieces smaller than a grain of wheat. Here's what's going on inside. 35,000 pounds of steel rods, hammering against 28,000 pounds of manganese steel plates, whirling around 17 times a minute. Tough going for the ore and for the steel rods too. This is what a 10-foot rod looks like after going through the mill. In the rod mill, much of the ore is ground fine enough and requires no further grinding. And this machine, called a classifier, floats the fine ore out and sends it on its way. Periodically, a measured quantity of quicksilver is fed into the mills. This laboratory demonstration shows what takes place in the rod mill. Quicksilver and gold brought together form a grayish, putty-like mass called amalgam. The heavy amalgam settles to the bottom of the pulp to be captured on a copper plate which also has been treated with quicksilver. Yes, sir, there's the first sign of gold we've had, but you'd never know it to look at it. The amalgam is softened by the addition of more quicksilver and cleaned up in this hydraulic press. All ready now for a last change of face into gold. The crushed ore is now leaving the rod mills on its way to the ball mills where two inch balls pound and grind, grind and pound the ore so fine that two thirds will pass through a 200 mesh screen. How fine is that? A square inch with 40,000 openings through which the sand must pass. The heavy material on the right is a sifting cloth used in flour mills to sift flour. Fine enough for flour, but it can't compare with the even finer mesh used in sifting the mill sand. These classifiers separate the sandy part of the ore from the overflowing slime. The overflowing slime is piped to another plant for special treatment. The sand is raked out of the classifiers to go on its way to the cyanide tanks. Lime is added to the sand pulp, another step in the chemical control of this complicated process. Water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. But what you see going into that tank is gold-bearing sand. The water just helps it along. There are 28 of these redwood tanks, each holding 700 tons of sand, eight hours to fill a tank, and 20 to drain the water from it. Then the top must be raked. Why? To prevent caking. And then air is forced up through the sand to provide oxygen necessary in the cyanide treatment. The incoming cyanide solution goes on dissolving the particles of gold left in the sand after amalgamation and liquefies it. It's hard to imagine gold being dissolved in a liquid like sugar in your coffee, but that is exactly what cyanide solution does. It turns gold into liquid. And there it is, liquid gold, gold in solution. And the solution in that bottle is worth about two cents. But what about the sand? Man-made erosion, washing it away, returning it to the mine for filling the stopes from whence it came. This tank holds 200 tons of gold-bearing solution, gold taken from finely ground ore by the action of chemicals. Remember the slime, that clay-like substance floated away in the classifiers? Here, the last minute particles of gold are taken from it in these great presses. Here is a department that is highly important, the assay office. From the time the ore is mined, samples are taken, crushed and analyzed for necessary control of operations. Every step of the way the ore is tested. This is for control, to make sure the right procedure is followed all along the line. There's the first piece of gold we've seen, and it weighs but a tiny fraction of an ounce. At last the gold is made, that is, if you can call the result of all the mining, grinding and processing you have just seen making gold. This is the end for the small briquettes of amalgam and the precipitate, the melting pot. With heat, the quicksilver is separated from the amalgam and the resulting crude bullion is taken out of the retorts. 
In this furnace, the gold precipitate is refined into crude bullion by melting. The impurities are removed by the slag. Next, the bullion is remelted and further purified, ready to be cast into gold bars. This is the final result of the vast operations above and below. Less than a week ago, this gold was imprisoned in hard and tough rock, thousands of feet below the surface of the earth. What miracles of science and engineering it took to recover this gold from the ore. Four tenths of an ounce of bright yellow metal is what you see here, and it comes from one ton of ore. One ton of ore mined with modern equipment. One ton of ore hauled and hoisted to the surface. One ton of ore crushed and ground to a fine sand. One ton of ore through the rod mill for amalgamation, through the great tanks for cyanidation. The coordinated effort of hundreds of men above and below the surface of the earth. Complicated machinery, modern science, all working together so that four tenths of an ounce of gold may be wrested from one ton of ore. But there are other things important to gold mining. Necessary, vast, basic, all blending to a common purpose. Sand filling, for example. Here, hundreds of tons of ore have been taken out. Something must be put back to fill the open spaces. Combating the great rock pressures which otherwise cause surface caving and to protect nearby underground workings, these openings must be tightly filled. But with what? With sand from the mill. After all the ore has been drawn from the shrinkage stopes, the stopes are filled with waste, barren rock. Then sand is sluiced into the broken rock for a tight fill. The successful mining of marginal low-grade ores depends upon holding cost to an absolute minimum. Since 1931, home stake taxes have increased at an alarming rate, and with them costs. Consequently, great blocks of ore are left in the mine, lost forever, because the cost of reopening the stopes in the future would be prohibitive. The lighter area is marginal ore. The black is ore. Increased costs cause shrinkage in the mineable ore, shorter life for home stake, and inestimable loss to its employees and to the state of South Dakota. Another engineering department has a highly important function in the home stake mining operation, mechanical engineering. This department has to do with maintenance, service, and operation. Every year, this department makes and sharpens over one and a quarter million pieces of drill steel for use in the mine. Special steels for 101 other uses are kept on hand at all times. Many kinds of special shop machinery are needed so that the mine and all other departments may receive prompt service and a supply of special parts and equipment. Over 4,000 feet of ventilating pipe are made annually to provide helpful ventilation at all depths. The foundry produces over 2 million pounds of iron castings every year. Repair work such as this for the maintenance and operation of hoists, crushers, conveyors, air compressors, mine pumps and boilers is constantly going on. Work as delicate as adjusting and balancing a fine scale or the repair of massive equipment weighing several tons. It's all in the day's work for these skilled and experienced home stake mechanics. Here at the home stake coal deposit, the mining of coal goes on spring, summer, fall, and winter. Coal for home stake light, power, and heat. Hundreds of tons of dirt are removed daily to expose the age-old bed of coal, and then Deep down into the bed of coal, nearly a hundred feet, goes the charge of explosive. There go thousands of tons of coal, one of nature's greatest servants harnessed for the use of man. Machinery for loading the coal onto endless conveyor belts, for transporting it to the tipple or sorting bin on the surface. Machinery for transforming it into power, Every day, 350 tons of coal roll out of the mine and into the chutes. Coal for light, power, and heat. Coal for the Kirk power plant at Homestake. Coal to turn the wheels of industry. Everything completely automatic, clean, and efficient. 
distilled water is used in the boilers to protect them against corrosion. Here it is made, 20,000 electrical horsepower, and distributed for heat, power, and light at home stake. Water trickling down from the Black Hills is piped over the mountains, through miles of tunnels to the surge tanks where imprisoned air is freed from it to drop nearly 700 feet below into one of Homestake's hydroelectric plants. 59 million kilowatts each year from hydro plants and steam, enough to light all of South Dakota's cities, all used in her great industry, the mining of gold. New construction and improvements at Homestake require tens of thousands of sacks of cement, all of which come from South Dakota's Rapid City Cement Plant. Crushed rock in great quantities to keep pace with the company's needs. This is all supplied by the Leeds City Crushing Plant. Bricks, hundreds of thousands of them for Homestake and for South Dakota are made by private enterprise at nearby Belfouche. South Dakota raw materials for new construction. South Dakota raw materials for a great South Dakota enterprise. More raw material in the towering forests these giants of nature are the backbone of the mining industry. Timber. Timber for the mines. Scientific methods are used in logging. No haphazard cutting nor waste in the great pine forests. Inspection before cutting. A weeding out process that gives the young trees a place in the sun. When the trees are stripped of their branches, they are loaded on trucks for transportation to the sawmill. No place for oxen or horses now. Big diesels do the work in good weather and bad. This big fellow is going to the mines. Out of the ground from a tiny seedling to a mighty giant of nature. Back to the ground to hold it up as man's great ally in industry. Timber for the mine and a lot of it. What you see here is about one year supply. All that lumber goes into the Homestake mine in a single year. You might wonder where it all comes from. It all comes from areas like this, but through selective cutting and reforestation, there is no denuding of the forests. Here is a typical reforested area. Yes, there's plenty of timber and plenty of beauty in the Black Hills for the generations of today and the generations of tomorrow. Homestake logging meets high standards of conservation in cutting, thinning, reforestation, and fire prevention. Trained men protect its own holdings and cooperate in emergencies on the public domain. Industry means science, raw materials, men. From the grizzled prospector of yesteryear to the great Homestake organization of today, a pioneer in the mining of gold, Yes, but a pioneer in the development of a greater claim, the loyalty and contentment of its employees. Homestake pushes on. This modern hospital, equipped with the finest of medical and surgical apparatus, is not only for the Homestake employee. Here, his family as well receives advice, counsel, treatment, and care from an expert staff of physicians and trained nurses at no expense. A liberal pension system adopted by Homestake in 1917 is an added comfort to those nearing the sunset of life. And for the employees training in safety, first aid, and mine rescue, an accident rate only one half of that for the American mining industry as a whole. Play, too, is stressed at Homestake, and there's plenty of it for the employees and for all the citizens of Leeds. This $300,000 recreation center was erected by the company in 1914 and includes a library with the knowledge of the world compressed into 26,000 volumes. And all this costs the community not one cent. These men are veterans, veterans of industry, veterans of homestake. Every one of them has been employed for 21 years or more. Right now, there are more than 400 members of the Homestake Veterans Association. This venerable gentleman, Mr. William Lang, has worked with Homestake for more than 50 years, just a temporary job. 
If you're musically inclined, there's the band, and a good one, too. Bass drum, big horns, piccolos, the whole works, and it makes good music. Happiness abounds, and why not? They are happy. Happy in the service of a company of which they are a part. Most of the employees of Homestake are homeowners, secure in the knowledge of constant, stable employment. Employment which has maintained a steady level through the years, regardless of the trials of the times. That is a basic Homestake policy. Yes, men are the most important thing at Homestake. Men from the North, the East, the South, the West, Men from the South Dakota prairies, men from lands across the sea, men seeking life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness under our flag and constitution. These men know that they are a part of Homestake, a part of an institution that is as much South Dakota as the Black Hills country from which it has grown, a part of the great industries in the state which contribute so many raw materials to the operation of this enterprise. These men know that their success the security of their families and the 25,000 people in the great state of South Dakota who are directly or indirectly affected by this industry depend on the success and continuation of this great enterprise.